We're born into this world in a position of weakness because we have to depend on the world for our food, not only for physical food, but also food for the mind. The Buddha lists three kinds of mental food. There's contact at the senses, consciousness at the senses, and then what he calls intellectual intention, which basically comes down to your intentions in general. We constantly have to feed off these things. For instance, with contact. If we didn't have sensory contact, we were put into a sensory deprivation tank and stayed for a long time. The mind would go crazy. Because, of course, without input from the five senses, the sixth sense can begin to go off on its own. And that's not just a sensory deprivation tank. Sometimes you get monks going off into the forest and living alone, and they get kind of strange. But not much coming in from the outside senses. The, the mind begins to feed on itself. And one unskillful thought feeds off of another, off of another. It can take you in strange directions. But when we do have sensory contact, we open ourselves to all kinds of things. We live in a world where all kinds of things can happen. All kinds of sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, good or bad. And we're constantly exposed. The Buddha's image is of a flailed cow. In other words, it's been beaten to the point where its skin is all worn off. Its wounds are open. Wherever it goes, the creatures that live in that area are going to feed off its blood, feed off its flesh. If it stands near a bush, the creatures living in the bush will feed off it. If it stands next to a wall, little bugs living in the wall will feed off it. If it just stands in the middle of the air, the bugs in the air will feed off of it. In other words, no matter where you go, you're open to all kinds of things happening. And yet this is where we look for our food. We're feeding off of our wounds. The image for intentions is very similar. A pit of burning embers. And you're immersed in that pit. You're burning on all sides. The image for consciousness is similar. A criminal is being speared 300 times a day. The food for the mind. It's basically wounds, and we're feeding off of wounds. As the Buddha says, we have to find a state where we don't have to feed anymore. In the meantime, of course, he gives us good things to feed on, and he also teaches us how to show some restraint in the senses. In other words, learning how to look at these things in such a way that we're not wounding ourselves even further. The good food he gives us is concentration. The two main topics he gives and he recommends as bases for sensory restraint are mindfulness of the body and the immeasurable states of mind that go with the Brahma Viharas. With mindfulness of the body, you get learn to have a sense of well being. You sit here just breathing. And you're totally immersed in the body, your sense of the body, as you feel it from within. You breathe in, breathe out. Think of the breath in ways that minimize any tension that would develop when you breathe in, breathe out. In other words, if you find yourself tense in the shoulders, it usually comes from the fact that you feel you have to breathe in through a nose where there's an obstacle that doesn't want, that doesn't want the breath to come in. We can think of breathing into the back of the neck or breathing up from the floor. See what that does. You can think of the breath going down the arms, going down the legs. You can have it either go inside the arms or on the surface of the arms. 
whatever feels good, whatever minimizes the pressure of the process of breathing, so that the body can feel light. And then you try to maintain that mindfulness. As you watch sights, listen to sounds, smell aromas, taste flavors, sense contact of the body. And when you're coming at input from the senses already well fed, you don't have to feed so much off of the wounds. And this way you can gain some control over your senses and not feel like you're being deprived. If you just tell yourself, I won't look, I won't listen, the mind's going to rebel. But if you learn to say, okay, I'm going to watch when I'm looking at something, what's my motivation for looking? What happens to my mind when I look in that way? When I'm listening to things, why am I listening? And what is my motivation? Or as John Lee would say, who's doing the listening? Who's doing the looking? Is greed doing the looking? Is lust, anger, fear, jealousy? If they are, they're going to get strengthened in your mind. But the fact that you can look at these things as processes, that depends on your feeling well fed inside. Because otherwise all you can think about is the food you get. But when you're already well fed, then you can look at your process of feeding on other things. And you realize you don't want to feed that way, because it has a bad effect on the mind. It's like noticing that you like a lot of sweets, and you give yourself something better to feed on. Then you look back at the sweets, and you realize, this is, this is bad for me. My reason for eating sweets is because I'm just totally immersed in the flavor, and I don't think about the consequences. You don't even feel the consequences. They're there, but you ignore them. So you're learning new feeding habits, and you're learning how to step back from those, those wounds that you've been feeding on. The Bodhi gives another analogy. It says the six senses are like different animals. And if you don't have that post of mindfulness immersed in the body, it's like taking the animals, tying the leashes to the necks, and then tying the ends of the leashes together, and the animals will pull in different directions. You've got a crocodile going down to the river, you've got a bird that wants to fly up into the sky, you've got a dog that wants to go into a village, a hyena that wants to go into a charnel ground, a snake that wants to go into a hole, a monkey that wants to go up in a tree. And the pole and pole and pole. And as Buddha said, the strongest one ends up dragging all the others, in which case would be the crocodile, drags everybody else into the river, they all drown. But if you've got the mind firmly established, inhabiting the body with a sense of well-being, it's like having a post, and then you tie the leashes of those animals to the post, and then pull as they might. They're not going to go anywhere, and they end up lying down next to the pole. So that's the role of mindfulness immersed in the body. The Buddha also recommends, in the same passage, that you develop goodwill for all, compassion for all, empathetic joy for all, equanimity towards all. You need all of those measurable attitudes, because as you're looking and listening, you're going to see people doing all kinds of things. They're harming themselves, harming one another. Think of the Buddha's image of the world. After he gained awakening, he surveyed the world. He saw everybody was on fire, and running around setting fire to one another. And so on the one hand, he felt compassion. But on the other hand, he had to feel equanimity, realizing there was only so much he could do to change what people are doing. You notice that when the Buddha taught, he didn't say he was going to teach everybody who was going to ferry all beings off to nirvana. 
he was a teacher of those willing to be trained. So I had to be realistic about his capabilities, spread goodwill to those he couldn't train, but also be equanimous about that fact. This is where all the Brahma-viharas go together as a set. When you can develop these attitudes, then you can look and listen and taste and touch, smell things, and you're much less likely to get irritated. Because if there's irritation, then there's resentment. From resentment, the mind gets stirred up. So notice, it's not simply a matter of being quiet and being mindful, but it's also having the right attitude, having right view about things, that you don't just go gobbling down your wounds. It's a weird image, but that's what we do. We're trying to get the mind to a place where it doesn't have to do that anymore. And the good news, of course, is that it can be done. This evening I was hosting a Zoom meeting, and one of the participants said, it sounds like we're, we're devaluing birth here, and it sounds like we just want to avoid being reborn. And he said, I don't want to live, I don't want to accept that kind of teaching. I said, well, look what, what's happening when you're being born. On the one hand, you're causing not only yourself a lot of suffering, but you're causing suffering to others, those that are inconvenienced by your presence on earth. And you're constantly feeding. And if you can't get your food in good ways, you're going to start getting it in bad ways. You can't really trust yourself. But the Buddha's not having you just run away. If you're going to leave the world, he says, first you've got to develop all the good qualities of the mind. Your gen generosity, your virtue, your ability to find pleasure outside of sensuality, your discernment, your persistence, your endurance and forbearance, your truth, your determination, your goodwill, your equanimity. And as you develop these good qualities, you benefit, the world benefits as well. And then it benefits even more when you pull yourself out of the feeding chain. It's not like samsara is a place that you're getting out of and running away and abandoning the people stuck in that place. Samsara is a process, and it's a process that involves suffering, not only for you but for the people you depend on. It's an addiction, but we can learn how to overcome that addiction. As we pull out of the process, everybody benefits. Because we're not running away to nothing. We're running away to a state where there's so much well-being that you don't need to feed on anything. And when you see all the pain and hardship that goes into feeding, and when you think about the fact that you're feeding off of wounds, You realize that the Buddha's path leads to something that really is desirable. Something that's good for everyone. So learn how to feed yourself properly. With mindfulness immersed in the body, developing the Brahma Viharas. So you can be restrained. You're not so eager to gobble down whatever the world has to offer. When you don't gobble it down, you can be more discriminating, more discerning what you do eat, what you do focus on. That way you don't have to gobble down poison along with what's good. As the Buddha said, nirvana is true health. We think of the health of the body and realize how precarious it is. But the health of nirvana is solid, unchanging. 
because it's not dependent on anything at all. <laughs> 